short now. Thank you so much, dear Professor Guy McPherson, for being with me again to continue our questions because we received so many of them. I'm so pleased you joined me again to continue answering. So how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to continue my educational efforts. So thank you very much for creating this opportunity and for soliciting the questions. And mostly they're good and fun. And the ones that aren't good, we well, at least have you. fun with. <laughs> we thank you. We trust on your experience, expertise in this field, the research that you do. And also you work with nature. That's a... You you grow your own food still, I believe, isn't it? A little bit, although it's far more difficult here in the cold climate of Vermont than it was in Central America, in Belize. There we could grow food year round and a lot of it. Here, well, we're just trying to get through the below zero days. And those are, those are the high temperatures, below zero Celsius. Yeah, every climate needs a little bit learning of different right. farming methods. Right. Even in the Netherlands, I moved from west to east, then I sensed the difference of the climate. In west, it was a little bit coast, a little bit rainier and more humid, but here it's more dry, and uh, the temperature difference between day and night is higher. I see the difference of growing food. So we, mm -hmm. it's a learning process. I still encourage people to learn about their own environment. And uh, probably they can find some YouTube videos to learn how to grow food. Isn't it um, some ambition to go in 2022? Oh, yes. And Pauline does most of the food growing in these parts. And she spends a lot of time on YouTube trying to figure out how to grow food in this particular location. But she's been she's been growing food for many many years since she was a teenager. So she she has lots of experience. What was the name of her channel? If people want to follow her, Pauline Project Love. Pauline Project Love, and mm -hmm. uh, she only speaks about love and loving things. It's so <laughs> lovely person, <laughs> you know me. Right. So let's go through our questions. In your list that I shared with you, I will start with question 13. And uh, because we went through one to 12 last time, if people want to see them, I will put the previous discussion and our early recordings as well in the description part of this video, they can find out. So 13th question comes from uh, our viewer called Donald Hawkins. Thanks a lot, Donald, for sending this question. And uh, he's asking so far, what is the plan? Is, if there's any, from world leaders on global warming? So I'm assuming that he's maybe asking it for United States, where you've got the most experience. And um, well, I don't know if you are watching us, uh, keeping eyes on Europe also. Uh, maybe you can also comment on other continents and uh, other world countries if you, you have ideas. Right. Well, because I'm not a world leader and because I'm not in frequent contact with world leaders, I don't know. I don't know that any of us know. You know, they say they're doing certain things and President Biden has this Build Back Better plan, but it's in serious jeopardy. And even if it passes, it's the change, the required changes are so far out in the future that I think we missed the point. You know, we need to start, we need to take action right now. We need to take action 20 years ago. And certainly right now we can't wait. And, and this has been the approach that political leaders have taken for my entire life and probably before is to push the difficult decisions and the difficult actions to the next administration. And we have good evidence going all the way back to the Nixon administration in the United States when I was a child and before you were even born, that they knew about climate change and 
they knew it was very serious and they didn't take any significant action. And you can find this. Right. And you can find some of this information at the essay at guymcpherson.com called Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored. And I updated that for a few years, pointing out how long we had known that we're in a mass extinction event, and how long we had known that we are warming the planet. So Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored, it's on every page at guymcpherson.com. So if you go to any page, scroll down to the bottom, or if you're on a, on a desktop or laptop computer, it's in the right-hand side. It's just right there. And there is lots and lots of evidence that world leaders have known for a very long time where we're headed. And now we're there, of course, on an overheated planet. And the, the, also put the link to the description and comments part again. That would be great. Thank you. And Carl Sagan said once, the problem with climate change is it goes slow enough in four years of someone's uh, political time, you don't see difference in four years. So they use the opportunity like nothing is happening. But exactly. in 10 years, there's obviously something is happening and they are already changed. They blame somebody else for taking responsibility. That's the problem with climate change always has been and still yeah. is, I believe, uh, this is how it's going. I think there's nothing else than do other than taking personal responsibility of our own lives, not waiting somebody else to come and rescue. Exactly. exactly. You know, President Donald Trump, when he was president, he, he was the most honest president I've ever seen with respect to climate change. He said, we're already screwed. We might as well just ignore climate change because it's going to kill us all anyway. Basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, it doesn't matter at this point. It's baked in. So enjoy, have a life. And, you know, people gave him, uh, we're, we're extremely critical of him for that and him not promoting action, but he's right that it's already baked in. The action should have been taken many decades ago. And here we are. What a surprise. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's um, both funny and sad. That's um, heartbreaking. But um, that's uh, what happens is what happens and what's going to right. happen. Uh, right. And, and, you know, that just points out how little control we have, you and I, even relatively distinguished professors who who represent the intellectual elite or or top level of in, intellect in the world we have no influence i don't know about you but i almost never get invited to the president's oval office to have a conversation that, that just oh, never happens news channel we, we wish to see you on news channels and that happens very rarely as well and and i think that the you know there's plenty of evidence that at least in the united states the corporate media have been working hand in hand with the government in presenting information so it's no surprise that i haven't been invited to participate in the corporate media outlets in the united states so so strangely i see only two names on american news i don't have tv channels in my home but i see on twitter and youtube uh, they only show michael mann and hey who and uh, all they promote is a little bit reduce co2 and uh, we have we solved the problem but um I mean, I'm not saying that don't reduce CO2, but it, the problem is not that. The problem is, uh, right. yeah, ocean acidification, the aerosols, and um, yeah, the biodiversity we lost and been losing. And um, even if we stop CO2 today, what's going to happen all the CO2 that we accumulated since the last hundred years? Exactly. I think my dear friend Kevin Hester says it best. I'm pretty sure he coined the phrase, the lion man. 
the lying man when referring to Michael Mann, because it's obvious that Michael Mann is lying about the situation. And it's also obvious that he is making no sacrifices on behalf of, quote, saving the planet. I, you know, I opted out of the monetary system in 2009 because I realized it was the monetary system that was driving us to extinction. It's just money flowing through the system. And I was participating in that system. So I said, I can't do this anymore. I just walked away. It didn't help, by the way. But I don't see Michael Mann even reducing his paychecks. I don't see him missing a steak at a meal. I don't see him skipping a flight to go tell the same nonsense he's been telling for years about how you and I have to change the way we live. I don't see him changing the way he lives. He's not setting an example. Again, Carl Sagan said, if you assume that the world is a ball, a basketball ball, you paint it with a varnish and assume that this is the atmosphere thickness. The varnish thickness is the atmosphere thickness, maybe even less. So that's the oxygen that we have. And right. we filled it all the way with um, the CO2 all the time. So that's um, reducing CO2 emissions now. How can it help to remove in what's already there? And um, yeah, when it comes to removal, it comes to other uh, funny stories. And, and where are we going to put it? You know, Dr. Tao, who you've spoken with as well, points out that even if we could capture all this carbon that we've in, emitted, there's no place on earth to put it. There's no, there's no place to store it. That's the other part of carbon capture and storage is the storage part. Where are we going to put it? So the, we, have, we have serious problems ahead of us, I'm afraid. Exactly. So uh, also we cannot answer this question. Probably the answer is take personal responsibility. I don't say like Donald Trump, like uh, go and live, we are already uh, done. Uh, I don't want to seek like him because um, I don't want to be misunderstood, like go and live your best life, take all the flights and uh, right. go uh, just polluting the planet because it's already gone. I don't want to be sounding like that, but uh, take personal responsibility and live ethically. And um, living ethics, uh, that, that would be the best help to yourself and to planet. I couldn't agree more, obviously. Thank you. So I continue with another question from Kylie Albrecht. I'm pronouncing the surname probably uh, incorrect. I'm sorry. Uh, Kylie says, if Earth experiences a blue ocean event, BEO, in the near future or otherwise, what would be a brief summary of the knock-on effects will be? I understand an answer to this question as mostly for speculation, but I would love to hear your version of this potential storyline. So he thanks in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, I had a discussion, maybe you noticed on my channel recently with Jim Massa. Mm -hmm. I asked him the same question and I asked him to relate it to Amok. Uh, what happens to Amok, the ocean circulation, when Arctic is gone, when the blue ocean event happens and Arctic is gone. And Jim Massa responded me back, uh, blue ocean event happened already. It's not when is it going to happen, but it's happened already, he told me. that, um, uh, And his impression that blue ocean event is just a definition, and from definition to definition it changes. Also, if you are measuring the extent, making the definition based on the extent, it also de uh, de depends on how you measure it. If you are measuring it from satellites, Satellites provide certain resolution. They don't see the melt ponds, breaks on the ice. They can see a complete uh, white piece, but it might be already broken, these gaps. They cannot know it. So the ocean event might already be happened. 
but uh, I don't know what the reviewer understands from Blue Ocean event. Maybe you make your own description uh, about what Blue Ocean event is for you and what you expect uh, afterwards to our planet. Yeah, um, Kevin Hester and I interviewed Jim Massa on the Nature Bass Last radio show. And he's been out on the front lines conducting research from the University of Alaska for many years and then doing other teaching, primarily now on his YouTube channel. And the, the typical definition of an ice-free Arctic is less than, what, 1 million square kilometers of ice in the Arctic because it's very difficult to measure and monitor the small pieces tucked in every little bay and cove and so on. But it's pretty easy for us to imagine that what we have now looks something like this, or maybe best case scenario, it looks like my shirt, sort of a patchy, broken up, dark blue and white. And when we lose what remains of the Arctic ice, it, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be a dark blue. And one of the consequences will be the very rapid heating as a result of the loss of albedo or reflectance. So I think that's probably the most important factor is when we lose albedo and we switch from white to that dark blue, the planet it won't be reflecting that incoming radiation anymore. It'll be soaking it up and overheating the ocean even more than the ocean is already overheated. Bear in mind that, what was it, 2018? No, I think 2019, the IPCC admitted that climate change is irreversible due to an overheated ocean. Already oh, irreversible due to an overheated ocean. So in addition to that change in albedo, I suspect we'll see a rapid release of methane and a rapid release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Initially in the Arctic, obviously, but it doesn't take long for the atmosphere to be fully mixed so that CO2 and CH4 are incorporated into the global environment, into the global atmosphere and is impacting everywhere on the planet. So. Well, you expect sudden temperature increase as an answer to this question after blue ocean events. Yes, rapid absolutely. And also rapid increase of CO2 and methane. Right. So that's, that's two factors. First, the very rapid rise in local, regional, and then global temperature as a result of loss of albedo or reflectance. And I suspect that will happen, that the... If, for example, we have an ice-free ocean this year, 2022, which I don't expect, but if we do, then the full effects will be manifest next year, 2023. I expect the first ice-free Arctic to occur in 2023, consistent with what James Anderson, the Harvard atmospheric scientist famous for discovering the link between chlorofluorocarbons and the hole over the Antarctic with respect to the ozone. He says, in after a presentation in Chicago, he was interviewed by Forbes on January 15th, 2018. He said, the chance there will be a permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero. And then about three and a half years later, Jennifer McKinnon at Scripps Institution said she expects an ice-free Arctic in 2022 this year, but maybe it'll happen in 2023, consistent with what Anderson said. And so that's what I expect is the, the initial ice-free Arctic, fully ice-free Arctic to her, happen next year and the full effects to be realized in the following year, 2024, with very rapid heating, alteration of the general circulation patterns around the planet, continued release of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. So very significant forcing occurring starting in the spring, summer of, of 2024. That's, that's what I would bet if I were a betting person. And, and it's not that I want this to happen. I hear all the- bet 
forget about the exact date. I mean, either 2026 or 2028 or 2030, it doesn't matter. That's where the world is heading. And uh, right. with, uh, compared to millions of years that the planet had, two years is nothing. <laughs> I mean, if you are making two years off in your estimation, I don't think you are making any mis mistake. We are talking about the uh, where the biodiversity, where the temperatures, where the all the trends are rolling through. Right, right. And I, I agree that at the level of the cosmos or even the planet, one or two or three years is nothing. It's completely irrelevant. However, is nothing. It's so however, however, for your life and mine, one year or two years or three yes. years can make a big difference. If, if you live with urgency, as we have done, if you try to pursue integrity in your life while also pursuing love in your life, then an extra month, an extra year, an extra two years is a long time. At least it can be. Yeah, for animals, they live much shorter than us, but they live more fulfilled, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they think. live more fulfilled life uh, because they're always here and now and they don't uh, hold re regret they don't hold right. any uh bad thoughts in their minds they are always happy they are always looking for what makes me happy today maybe right. after a bowl or just hugging that um I, I think we should learn from them absolutely human animals have a lot to learn from other animals <laughs> Indeed. But uh, I also want to add something that you uh, mentioned the temperature sudden increase. And when we are talking about the temperature increase, most of the time we say, for instance, two degree increase. And people maybe assume that two degree increase is not, nothing. I can just open my windows. <laughs> two degrees would be okay, but two degrees is a global increase right. in the land the increase becomes more sudden than the um, sea and ocean. So if the oceans uh, become six degrees warmer, that means maybe 30 degrees warmer in a city in Europe, uh, which is not habitable, inhabitable for right. Uh, right. And that's a critical point that most people fail to recognize. They say, well, I went outside today and it was zero degrees. Then I came back in the house and it was 20 degrees Celsius and I'm fine. You know, I just had to put on another shirt or whatever. And that's not the important thing here. The important thing here is habitat for human animals and for the many other organisms with which we oh, share the planet. Animals. If we lose bees, as Einstein said, we, we have only three years on the planet. We need right. food. Right. Yeah. And food is nice. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I love all vegetables and fruit. I want them. So let's go with question 15. It seems so that uh, super dioxide levels are what drives a major component of ice age. Could we start a mini ice age of 10,000 uh, to 1,500 years to cool the planet before nature makes another ice age? Or we, can we speed up the ice age by putting super dioxide in the or so it's making an artificial aerosol asking like some masking like something how do you understand the question i understand the question i think it's pretty ridiculous we have already overheated the planet to such an extent that attempting to cool it with sulfur dioxide is not a viable approach I think the only viable approach to stabilizing and then cooling the planet is the mere reflection framework that we've talked about yeah. before. Yeah. It's the brainchild of Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard's Roland Institute. And I don't see enough support for that framework yeah. yet to take off. I but mentioned last week that uh, it's nice because it's a passive method. It's not spraying anything to ocean or atmosphere. It's just reflecting the sunlight back 
uh, we know how the mirror works and uh, it's not right. doing anything to nature so it might cool down the planet uh, mm -hmm. without causing any uh, side effects but with super dioxide spraying to atmosphere we don't know what happens next we will breathe it exactly and so i'm not a big fan of spraying the sky with anything in part because the local effects are unknown and also in part because did we are we willing to ask anybody's permission are we going to spray the skies yeah. over amarillo without asking the people in amarillo of course not i'm, I'm not sure this is consistent with international yeah. law in fact but anyway i don't see it happening anyway because I don't see the sort of collaboration and cooperation between countries to make it happen. So I think it's a moot point. Unfortunately, I don't think we are going to try anything to stabilize the planetary temperature. Yeah. So we still wish people to spread the word about my reflection project, but even then that's a helpful approach a passive approach, reliable, healthy approach to cool down the planet, but not a solution alone. Also, because uh, we need our soil, we need uh, also other care to environment. I mean, we cannot put the mirrors and continue the life as it is, just taking more flight tickets. Uh, we, we should change the ways that we live anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, somebody is asking about in question 16 can humanity survive a 50 gigaton methane burst i think they are referring to study of uh, shekova um, could you please uh, tell a little bit, bit about shekova's study uh, which kept me awake several nights last year <laughs> i read a lot about her and talked to my mother a lot so now she also knows shekova Maybe other viewers can also understand, first of all, what we are talking about. Then we answer the question. Natalia Shikova and Igor Samelatov are research partners and life partners from Russia. And she at least has an academic appointment at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And they've been conducting research on the importance of methane and other greenhouse gases on the Eastern Siberian continental shelf off the coast of Russia for many years. And I can't remember what year they gave the presentation, maybe 2012, it was quite a long time ago at the European Geophysical Union meeting. And they indicated that a 50 gigaton burst of methane was highly likely for abrupt release at any time. And emphasis on at any time, it can happen tomorrow it can happen next week and and they made this statement and they made this statement many years ago and they indicated that a 50 gigaton burst would contribute to a 1.3 degrees celsius global average temperature rise 1.3 c very quickly i can't imagine humans perhaps most other organisms surviving that because it's such a rapid rate of change and that's an important factor that most people are not aware of even most climate scientists because most climate scientists are astronomers or physicists so they don't understand the biological and ecological add-on effects of physics and chemistry and how those interactions affect what's going on in nature in the actual world so That's one point like this you know, every day I see climate scientists looking at the Copernicus uh, satellite websites mm -hmm, to look mm -hmm. at methane levels measured by satellites. And they say, okay, this is like linear trend. This is uh, just going like this. I say there is more under the ground and under the ocean. It's, it might just suddenly come up and satellites cannot measure it. They made predictions, Shekova made predictions, making land measurements. Uh, that's what she's talking about. And looking at satellite views, you can all only see what is there, but what is, the what is to come is the question. 
Exactly. And there's two important sources of methane that you just pointed out. There's a relatively shallow continental shelf, including where they work on the East Siberian Arctic shelf. Or, and then there's also the land-based permafrost that throughout the Northern Hemisphere in the Arctic region has, you know, that permafrost has become permamelt and is releasing methane and carbon dioxide under pressure. There's actually been measurements, people have gone out with microphones and they open up a little hole and you can hear the hissing as the methane and carbon dioxide are coming out of the yeah, ground. Like, there are videos right. Also. right, exactly. It's coming out under pressure. And so this is hugely important and that very rapid rate of environmental change is the exact thing that Strona and Bradshaw were writing about in their scientific report from Mm, I think November 13th, 2018. It's an open, open access journal, scientific report. So you can find that paper and, and track it down. And it's that very rapid rate of change, faster than organisms can adapt genetically and then reproduce. That's the important factor here. It's not that we can't go outside, oh, it's cold, but we'll just go back inside. No, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the ability to adapt evolutionarily from the perspective of natural selection and keep up with the, that environmental rate of change. That's, what's, that's what is going to do us in. And what most happens? Of the Maybe the question is, what happens if the uh, gigatons of methane comes? Is it going to cause a big forest fire? Is it going to make us difficult to breathe suddenly here in our city? Do I need a mask or are we going to immediately die or a new disease maybe comes up? What, what is going to uh, I happen? I suspect the most important factor comes the following spring. That tremendous increase in global average temperature is something that plants cannot adapt to. Mm. So if you hear, for example, in Vermont, in New England generally, the trees and the, the sap they produce this, that leads to maple syrup, which is an economically important item here, that depends- yeah, Pauline, I'm vegan, it's my honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pauline has it in her coffee every morning, maple oh. syrup, <laughs> no sugar oh. for her. <laughs> and and so the ability of trees to transport that material up and down the tree that, that we call sap that goes into making the syrup depends completely upon a stable temperature. These, these trees have evol evolved via natural selection to this environment over thousands of years. We're talking about changing the temperature enough within a year within a few months, within the lifetime of the trees, they can't adapt that fast. They're not gonna produce any sap. And then no maple syrup for you. And no maple syrup in her coffee for, for Pauline. And more importantly than that, the trees will die. They cannot adapt to such a rapid rate of change. It's not just the trees, it's the mycorrhizal fungi underneath the tree that, that works symbiotically with that tree in a mutualism to ensure that they have enough nutrients and enough water to continue to persist. And those trees support the life of many organisms, many animals, including human animals as well. So you can't just change the climate of an area essentially overnight, certainly not in the span of a year or two and expect there to, no be, to not be a response. Of course, there'll be a very rapid response. Plants, animals, human animals, we're all in this together. And those rapid rates of change are exactly the kind of thing that have driven previous mass extinction events. That's absolutely sad for, I mean, for the beauty of this planet, all these beautiful species. Look at all the other planets. They are, they are also so beautiful, but ours is unique. Why do we do this harm? and? Um, it's already done, actually. We are born into this. We are all born into this, our generation. Right. But yeah, let's stop at this doing further and try to live ethically and happy. It doesn't matter 
when the methane burst is, when the into the ocean event is. Let's um, just appreciate how beautiful planet it is. So that's I think all I can suggest for people to do, but uh, so heartbreaking to hear the difficulties that's waiting for all species. Of course. Already happening. It's <laughs> it's hard to live with this knowledge. You and I would in some, some days we would not we don't even want to know. We want to just continue our lives like 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet, knowing nothing about what's headed our way, knowing that we're, as a species, we're responsible for this mass extinction event. That doesn't make either of us happy, right? Maybe I ask a question. Do you sometimes wish that you never studied this? You did some in other job, I, I don't know, totally unrelated. You didn't hear about climate problems and you, you just did <laughs> fun and uh, you didn't know what's happening. Yes, every day of my life, I wish for something. I wish that I hadn't left active service at the university because I didn't know about the aerosol masking effect. I, you know, th that, that change from professor to professor emeritus cost me every relationship in my life. I was betrayed that's almost immediately part. by everybody I knew. That's the sad part. So, so question. many, many times I wish I didn't know anything. Ignorance is bliss. You know that expression, ignorance is bliss. I wish I was blissful, but like you, I can't unknow it. Once it's in here, you can't get it out. Well, at least not without a lot better drugs than I have access to. <laughs> well, uh, still by knowing, um, people manage it differently. Some people know and do not care. Some people know and have anxiety attacks, depression, panic attacks. And some people, uh, hear it, know it, uh, get curious about it, uh, mm -hmm. just to find out more and learn more. What can I do? What can I find more? And some people have deep grief about what's happening. I still want to pull people to know about the facts because I like being truthful to ourselves and, and uh, have courage to look into eye of what's happening. But um, I'm a little bit uh, both scientist and artistic soul. I want to use the opportunity. Of course, I grieve a lot, but mm -hmm. I want to use my grief to uh, for two purposes. One is curiosity, like uh, can I use some mathematics to find different models or different methods to measure this and communicate it with other people? And the other thing is artistic. Uh, with my grief, I want to write songs, I want to sing uh, songs, I want to write poems, I want to paint, do paintings with my grief. The, in, if we look in the past, all these artists have not been always happy, but they used their right. uh, grief and sadness to create something from their soul. And I think that's also fulfilling. We can always find something to fulfill our lives. I agree. And bear in the mind that through the 1960s, medical doctors, the ethics of the medical industry included not telling people that they had a terminal diagnosis. They would sometimes tell the family, but Sometimes they would just not tell the patient that you're going to die in three months, six months, a year. And we know this with great certainty, 99% certainty. And we are faced with the same thing today. And to not reveal information about the aerosol masking effect, to not reveal information to the public about the rapid rate of environmental change and what the likely consequences are, to not reveal that we're in the midst of a mass extinction, all those things to me are like the medical doctors in the early 1960s who were withhold, withholding information from their patients. I think we have a responsibility to share that information and let people do with it what they will. 
I also think that we have the responsibility to point to other alternatives besides depression and grief. And so that's been a significant part of my work over the last roughly a decade is trying to help people through this very difficult information in a positive manner. And the, the primary way I've been doing that is pointing out to people that they already know, they have known since they were probably 12 years old that they're going to die. It's only a matter of when and how. And that's, that remains the same till you're 50, till you're 60, till you're 70 years old. You know you're going to die. So environmental effects or some accident at home just sliding from the staircase it might be also uh, possible today or tomorrow uh, we right. don't know of how long our lifetime so it's better to live it today the best we can as homer wrote in the iliad some 2800 years ago any moment might be your last So live, I try to encourage people to live with that in mind. And yes, it can cause sadness, but it doesn't have to cause sadness. There's also the joy that comes from, I made it through another day. I made it through another week. I lived to see another beautiful place in the world. Yeah. And also knowing how short our lives is gives us a power to skip some bad thoughts like if we assume that we will never die or our lives are so long, we are stuck in very small, tiny negative things and thinking about it again and again, but we assume that we might even go today or tomorrow, then we can just skip this. That's maybe not very important at all. We might have a different character to look at things differently. And that's something else that Homer wrote in the Iliad. Right before he wrote, any moment might be our last, he pointed out that that's why the gods envy us mortals. The gods <laughs> envy us because they live forever. So why should they live in the that's moment? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. The gods don't live in the moment. They have, a, they have an infinity of moments laid out before them. They don't appreciate the here and the now like we can if we choose. That was wonderful. The next question, 17, asks, uh, since we are expecting a near-term uh, extinction of the species, uh, they're asking a little bit personal to you. What are your plans? How do you spend your life? But I think you answered with these comments already. This is also how you live. Is, is that true? Day by day appreciating what is beautiful in the environment uh, living with people that you love right so the question is what will you be doing in late 2025 and i suspect i will be dead in late 2025 i mean i'm not happy about that don't get me wrong but i'm living as if i will not be alive then because i don't think there will be habitat and i do not want to live on this beautiful earth if there is no habitat, because if we lose habitat, that means the nuclear power plants will melt down. It means we will be surrounded by a dead planet, that all these trees out here will lose their leaves, the trees will die, they will begin falling over, the animals will die. It's, I don't want to live in a bunker with canned peaches to keep me alive. I don't want so to live that way. Maybe in the same uh, bunker. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so if, if James Anderson and Jennifer McKinnon are correct, then there will be no habitat on this planet for humans in, in 2025 or 2026. So I'm not interested personally. Now, if they're wrong, and I would love for them to be wrong, then what will I be doing in late 2025? I'll be having another conversation with you in this forum so that people can watch it later and can say, oh, Guy McPherson was wrong. What an idiot. I will be glad to be called the idiot in this case. By there might, there, I'm assuming that there might be some anomalies and there's always a chance that your predictions might be wrong. 
Of course. I would be scared even more because what happens to Paul Erdich? We know uh, they said he was wrong uh, right. when he made the overshoot estimation. He said food will not be enough. Then they found new growing methods. Okay, for population overgrowth, we've got enough food. But now we again talk about the food shortages. We again talk about the population overgrowth, overshooting. So that uh, turned out to the same story, but even worse than he expected. We just extended the time, but things became even more complex to recover. If we find a way to extend our time, I, I will be scared that uh, things will be even more complex when we are making this recording with you in 2025. And by the way, I've met Professor Ehrlich and we've had conversations like this one. And he's as happy as anybody to have been proven of wrong. To be wrong, of course. He does not want mass starvation all over the planet. Of course he doesn't. Of course. What, what happened was we had another agricultural revolution, the second agricultural revolution, and we managed to grow a lot more food than we thought we had been capable of growing when he wrote the Population Bomb and had it published in the late 1960s. And then the 1970s come along, we, we learn all kinds of new ways to grow food. So he was wrong. He loves that. He loves being wrong about that item. I go to question 18 and I give you a comment. I'm not saying uh, anything anymore. Will humans in bunkers with can, canned food survive long in light of the unattended nuclear power plants and no way to replenish food supply? I can't imagine that those people will live very long and every minute will be miserable. Can you imagine Im being immersed in ionizing radiation? Elon having... Musk sitting in the same small bunker, eating the same canned food. That's right. A... <laughs> it sounds terrible. No thanks. <laughs> no. So will people no. survive? For a short time, probably, but they'll be surrounded by like-minded sociopaths. They all hate each other, and eventually they're going to kill each other or kill themselves because it's such a miserable set of living arrangements. I don't think anybody who has thought about that and thought it through really wants to live like that. I certainly don't. No, no. I'm going to question 19, but he wrote several questions in months. I will try to summarize them as quick as I can. Uh, he first asked about the book called Overshoot, written by William R. Ketton. What, the, what do you think about the Overshoot book, and what should we learn from it? You know, William Ketton... Uh, asked about the book earlier. I, I don't know about that. Okay, William Ketton's book, Overshoot, came out in 1980 and describe the likely consequences of being in human population overshoot. And I was 20 years old in 1980, and I'd had, I had taken several college courses in biology and ecology. So I didn't read the book. I didn't see any need to read the book. He was right, and he was pointing out what Paul Ehrlich famously pointed out many years previously, and also what Garrett Hardin another ecologist in the University of California system have been pointing out for a long time as well. So I didn't read the book because I didn't see a need. I, I think there's some um, undoubtedly good information and a summary for people who are unfamiliar with what happens when other organisms go into population overshoot. So it's, I would recommend it Interestingly, a book I haven't read I'm recommending because I think it does provide a good summary. Perfect. Again, the same uh, questionnaire person uh, is asking about how to talk to young people. Uh, I received this question so many times. It's also our last question in the list, so we can answer here uh, as well. Um, if people have children or uh, young uh, people in their families or in their classes, if they are educators, how should they give information about 
uh, irreversible impacts uh, have been done on this planet? How to communicate this? Well, one of the reasons I don't have children is because I because of what I foresaw in 1979 when I was 19 years old. That's when I decided to not have children of my own. However, I'm honest with young people. I, I don't force this information onto young people. I don't force this information onto anybody at this point. But if people ask me about what I foresee or what the evidence indicates, then I present the evidence. But with young children, that's pretty, you know, that's, I don't know. I haven't raised somebody who's five or six or eight or 12 years old. I don't know how I to deal don't with have people. children. It's also difficult for me to say, but let's say if I had a small kid next to me now, if I had it in interview with Guy McPherson and we are talking to this, would you speak a little differently or would you speak in the same way? Well, it's kind of interesting. Up till the age of, I don't know, 10 or 12, I suppose it depends upon the maturity of the child, up until a certain age, you can tell kids anything. And I've seen parents who told their kids anything. I, I've seen a five-year-old girl being told by her mother that she could die any day. And the, and the five-year-old gets very sad for about a minute and then goes chasing after their dog, laughing and screaming and giggling again. So I, th I think this is a great example, like the one you presented with non-human animals, of a human animal living in the moment and enjoying that every moment. So I think the impact of telling very young people is very fleeting. At what point does somebody become old enough, emotionally mature enough, to think about the information and consider the impacts on their lives. I suspect that happens around age 12 or so based on everything I've read. And then I would be more circumspect. I would maybe ask the child questions, which is what I did in my classrooms when I was on campus. I would just ask questions. I would not transmit information unless I was asked. All that information is out there. We have the internet now. You can find information, that's not the limiting factor. The ability to process that information and make decisions in your own life in light of that, that's the important part. How do we deal with that information in a pos positive and meaningful way? How do we find a purpose for my life and for your life? Those are the kinds of things that I want people to focus on no matter how long we have. And because I decided not to have children of my own, I'm not sure how I would approach this, really. I'm, I'm uh, assuming that when we are a child, uh, we've got different time uh, experience. Days are longer, years are longer, like my next birthday is never coming. But now my next birthday is just like a day. It's just close because of the red race we went into our time concern is much different. The days, years are just flowing away. But uh, when we are child, our time dif uh, understanding of time is different. Days are really very long. So maybe they will just stay in that mindset. They will have longer time even if they have 10 good years ahead. They will have 100 years like to live right and maybe they they will use that time that those 10 years differently not maybe pursuing other people's interest but finding some interest of themselves who knows maybe they find a way to grow trees faster to grow food something to make water in one way they will use their intelligence given us uh, in the most in real manner, not the manner that we force in our society, but in real, um, in real need. <laughs> the most important thing I've learned in my life, and so this is the, the piece of information I try to transmit to other people, is how to live in the here and now. How to appreciate this moment and the moments to follow. And so I try not to focus on too far out of course we have to plan and especially 
young people who are in middle school or junior high school or high school, they're planning for that future of going to college, for example, or learning a trade so that they can be a, become a good mechanic or whatever. And so there has to be a little forward thinking. And fortunately, I've been forward thinking enough that I have sufficient money so that I can survive in the here and now. So there's that balance, always that balance between living in the here and now and also planning for more here's and now's in the not too distant future or maybe in the distant future. Yeah. I'm asking the last question from the same person because uh, he has written so many and some of them we addressed already. He's asking the spiritual practices which might help uh, other people uh, for instance, you mentioned sometimes Stoicism, sometimes Buddhism. What kind of spiritual practices that might be helpful for other people? Right. So I'm mostly anti-religion. As a scientist, I'm agnostic. In my personal life, I'm atheist. But I don't tell other people what to do, and I don't give advice about what kind of religion or spirituality other people pursue. So I'm pretty sure that this is all we have, that this planet and our physical existence on it is all we have. I've seen no evidence to convince me otherwise. And so I don't live as if I'm going to go to heaven or hell. I don't live as if this is a trial run and there's something to follow. <clears throat> and that's consistent with the notion of living in the here and now, living in this moment that Homer focused on so much in the Iliad and many other people have focused on as well. And, you know, I could get hit by a bus later today and given the way people drive in this part of the world, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And so I try to live with that in mind, with, with death over my shoulder, as it were, and in living with integrity, living with gratitude for the time we have, living with appreciation for this moment and for the moments to come. I think that's after 60, how many years? 61 years and 10 months. I think that's about as good as I can come up with. Thank you so much. So another question, question 20 from Thomas Rice. Thomas is also appearing on my channel sometimes. I'm, I'm really appreciating uh, his contribution. He's also trying to help with distributing the idea with Mary Reflection Project. I'm really thankful for this. Thomas asked a question and he sent a picture. I will put it on screen. Are iron salt aerosols a solution to fight methane, he asks. So are there some uh, artificial techniques, methods to uh, put the methane down on the earth or? Yeah, I, th I think what is being discussed here is the idea of putting iron filings into the ocean. And a rogue scientist whose name I can't remember tried that several years ago. It violates international law. And it had the opposite of the expected outcome. I can't remember any of the details. You're probably able to use an online search engine and follow up on this if you're interested. But it had the opposite of the intended effect. The, as I recall, there was a plankton bloom or the opposite of the plankton, all the plankton die. I can't remember any of the details, but it didn't pan out as expected, as is so often the case in these, quote, experiments or trials that are attempted without seeking proper feedback before beginning the experiment. Yeah. I go to question 22, since I, I'm guessing for 21, it's not really related to our field, asking about COVID, but um, not our field. 
I must go into a question of Colleen, why, why there are uh, many differences of blue ocean events discussion in between 2017 and 2015? Probably because we don't know exactly, I would say, all the factors and uh, what kind of life changes we might make. There are too many parameters that we know and we don't know. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the, I think the only published paper on the topic, and certainly in such a renowned source, was published in the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences in 2012 by Vislav Maslavsky and colleagues, and pointed and projected using a linear projection, projected the ice free Arctic to occur in 2016 plus or minus three years. And one of the uh, contributors to that projection being incorrect was relatively few data points. And the last of the data points occurring at the time in, mm, I can't remember the year, maybe 2009, but a much lower year than the others. So that dragged down you know, we had relatively small One data, data set. Points, uh, right, exactly. Yeah. So that out, that outlying data point yeah. caused the projection to occur earlier than it would have if that data point had been just a notch higher. Yeah, all the newspapers write, uh, scientists are wrong. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I had a conversation with Professor Mazlowski when I was in Monterey on a speaking tour. And you can find that recorded conversation at Nature Bats Last at guymcpherson.com. But it's, it's been a few years back. Anyway, now they have come up with a way of predicting whether it will be an ice free Arctic, but the model they use predicts only out six months in advance. So for the September period, which is typically when there's the least ice in the Arctic, th that's the annual minimum for September, they can only predict beginning in, what is that, May, June, July, August, no, March, late March. In late March, they can use the model to predict whether there will be an ice-free Arctic in that year. And, you know, for those of us who are familiar with the likely consequences of an ice-free Arctic, that's really important information. Because if it's going to happen, say, this year, 2022, which I don't think it will, then we can expect really dire impacts, including loss of habitat for humans, to occur the following year, 2023. So if if the model works well and gives us a correct reading that this this year will be the first ice-free arctic in the history of civilizations on the planet since the emian in fact then we'll be able to plan accordingly in our lives that we only have a very short time remaining but whether whether that occurs or not we still only have a very short time remaining <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't matter one year earlier or one year less, as we say. So live fully. Um, I get one last question because we answered all the other questions. They are similar. One last question from Sheila Frances. I'll also put her nice picture on the screen. Thanks a lot, Sheila, for sending your picture. She's asking, will you speak about the methane burst in your channel in Arctic blog posts? And uh, are you going to make maybe a little bit more detailed analysis in your channel about uh, what's coming, what's waiting for us in terms of methane and methane bursts? Well, maybe she refers to a, a paper at Arctic blog post, the Arctic news blog post uh, by oh, Sam. Okay, this is different, uh, not, not your uh, own uh, website, but different uh, blog post. I no. She thought about Guy McPherson's uh, website. No, no, no. Uh, she's, she's referring to Sam Karana's analysis that I have not oh, seen. Okay. That I didn't so, look. No. So, so I don't you? know what he said, what he or she says, Sam Karana. So I don't know how to comment on that. In fact, I've, I used to spend quite a bit of time at the Arctic News blog post, but I don't anymore. 
now I focus almost exclusively on peer reviewed papers and the yeah. authors who write those papers. Yeah. And uh, we also written a paper together with you. I'm so happy with it. Almost going to be published. I will be so happy also to discuss about that where we uh, mentioned uh, impact of uh, methane as well as one of the contributors to our uh, um, process that we are going through. So one of the components. So yes, uh, I look forward from the uh, peer reviewed literature. And uh, that would be the thing that we discuss. Right. I look forward to that discussion as well. I look forward to that paper coming out. Have you heard anything about it? You're, you're the corresponding author. <laughs> it's almost there, almost there in public. Okay, excellent. And we will make a detailed tour on our paper next time. <laughs> so we can close today. If you have a uh, last few words to say, we can uh, say goodbye. Thank you again for this opportunity, Professor. And I always welcome the next one. I think it's important for us to have these conversations in part because we're responding to questions from people. And so we can gauge what people find interesting and want to know about. And I appreciate that you send the questions in advance because I don't always, I don't know, you know, I don't, I have a limited amount of material in here. And, and so this gives me an opportunity to look up additional information, which I appreciate. So it's, it's sort of like being in the classroom you present certain information, you know some questions are going to be asked, and some of those questions will actually be informed and intelligent, like most of the questions we receive here. So thank you for the opportunity. It's great having these conversations. I thank to you from myself, from my heart, and also on behalf of all this audience, thousands of people watch it afterwards, after recording. They send me so lovely messages. They are so thankful to see you. And um, they also find support for their lives uh, about living in here and love, uh, here and now with love, <laughs> appreciating the moment. Uh, thanks a lot for being there and uh, doing these interviews with you. Hopefully soon, this is on my channel, also on Nature Pet Plus. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So see you next time.